Hello, everyone. Uh, I guess you can hear me. So let's start. We'll talk about serverless today. But we, before we start our talk, I would like to present myself. I'm Slobodan Stojanovic. Uh, I'm CTO and uh, partner at, oops, sorry, at uh, Cloud Horizon, a small Canadian Serbian company. And we're doing a lot of web applications and things like that. We're also building some of our small products now and things like that. Also, I'm organizing JavaScript meetups in Belgrade, Serbia. Um, and uh, you can follow me on Twitter. And uh, whenever I have some time, I'm playing with some open source things. And all of them are on uh, GitHub, including some serverless things, of course. So before we begin, I would like uh, to know something about you. So I have a few questions. First, I guess all of you are developers, right? Yeah. So how many of you worked with Node.js? Cool. How many of you are working with JavaScript? I guess everyone. <laughs> it's a JavaScript <laughs> conference. Yeah, cool. So how many of you tried the serverless in any way? So AWS Lambda or something like that? Cool. OK. So yeah, let's start. First, is this just another talk about serverless? And why do we need this talk? Because there's a bunch of things regarding serverless on all conferences and things like that. So let's start with, uh, I would like to tell you why serverless is important for me. It doesn't mean that it will be important for you in the same way, but uh, maybe a year and a half ago, a friend told me about that serverless thing, and I was like, no, I just don't want to do that. I already, I'm already doing Node.js and everything. Uh, my setup is OK. I, I'm using Happy or Koa or something like that, and everything works perfectly for me. Then after some time, I wanted to build some chatbot, and I was like, OK, I really trust that friend, and I respect his opinion, so let's try that thing, because if he's so passionate about that, some something that can be useful. So I tried to play with it, and now, a year and a half uh, later, I, I don't think I built any node application that is not serverless, because it's very easy to do things that I do, so quick prototypes and things like that. I don't need to think about server and things like that. I just uh, run one command and everything is online. So even uh, cross-origin requests and things like that works, so I don't need to spend more time on the, uh, setting up servers and things like that. So that helped me a lot. A lot. And also, whenever we wanted to scale that uh, to another level, it worked, because it, it was really simple to just uh, convert that prototype in some small product and things like that. So here's a few things that we'll try to cover today. First, what is serverless? We'll try to explain uh, how that works. We'll also try to explain what platforms can you use for serverless. There's a few of them. Then uh, we'll explain, of course, how it works with Node.js, because we're JavaScript developers, so that's the most important thing for us. Also, one of the common questions that they have all the time is how to debug serverless function, because you, you don't have terminal anymore, so you're not able to see something. You're not running your application on your local hosts. So you're, you're not able to see console logs and things like that. Also, an important question is, when should you use it? Because it's obviously not for everything. And one more question that is important for me, is it secure? Is it something that we can use for real things, or is, is it just a toy that we can use for some small projects. And let's go. First, let's start with what is serverless. If you try to Google uh, that, first you'll see it's a platform as a service. But that really doesn't explain what serverless is, because there can be many things that are platform as a service. So for example, uh, I don't know, uh, Parse was platform as a service. Even S3 for files is a platform as a service, and a bunch of other things, some unrelated to programming. So that really doesn't explain serverless really well. But if you continue Googling that term, you'll see function as a service, which kind of uh, lowers the things that that can be. But again, it's confusing. It's not something that really explains what serverless is and why do we have it and why do uh, we want to use it. So I like explaining things with something simple. And uh, how many of you played with Lego bricks? Yeah. How many of you step on the Lego brick? <laughs> so how do you explain serverless with Lego bricks? Is serverless like stepping on a Lego brick? It can be probably, but uh, that's not the main idea. 
So let's imagine we have one four by four piece of uh, Lego brick. And let's imagine that's our server. It doesn't need to be physical server. It can be a cloud server or something like that. So if you're using Amazon, it can be EC2 instance or instance on DigitalOcean or something like that. So how do we build our applications? We build some uh, controllers or whatever of our application and we put that on the server like this. So imagine that this is a user, uh, user management part or something like that. Then imagine that this part is uh, payments and this part is email, uh, sending e uh, handling emails and uh, allowing us to send an emails to customers and things like that. Then we have a core feature of our application. And finally, we have some, something for images. And for example, uh, we want to generate some PDF reports and things like that. And with monolith application, we just glue all those things together. So everything goes in the same package. Oops. So, but what if we need to scale that? How do we scale that? With a monolith application, uh, basically we need to create a copy of everything. And if you need to scale it more, we create another copy. And it's not that simple because if you have database, it needs to be removed from that server to some other service or some other server. Then we need to have a load balancer that will tell uh, users to go on to one of those uh, servers. And then beside that, you need to keep session somehow and things like that. So it can be a bit painful. We already saw that. And the biggest problem is most of the time, you really don't need to scale everything. Maybe you're using just the user system because a bunch of users are using the application and core feature of your uh, uh, web application. And other parts, you just need to scale because everything is glued together. And also, the other problematic part is, what if something fails? So if something fails, like an email system, everything can just go away. And we need to find a way to recover that server and things like that. So how do we solve that problem? There's microservices, of course. And how that works with microservices? Basically, in theory, it should just, uh, we still have some server, but now each of our components should have separate servers, and each component should go on the separate machine. So we build our system by doing user management, I don't know, email system, payments, uh, core feature, then some feature for PDF generation and things like that. And scaling now is something that is, should be trivial, so we should just copy some things that we need. We don't need to copy, I don't know, uh, email system because we don't need more of them. And if we don't use something like uh, we don't want to generate PDFs anymore, we can just remove that service. Everything should work fine. Also, if something fails, um, we have a backup. But the problem with that is if the other thing fails and we didn't uh, copy that and make a backup of it, not a backup, sorry, uh, make a, another machine, uh, we'll still have a problem because that service will not work until we recover the machine or whatever. So that's one problem. The other problem is servers are not that cheap. They are cheap, but really not that cheap that you can just buy a bunch of them. Just try explaining that to your boss or something like that, that you need. 10 servers for some, uh, to start application that will be ready in six months. I'm not sure they will be happy. So how do we make ser uh, web servers cheaper? Oh, sorry, uh, microservices cheaper? By just uh, bundling them together on the same machine. And if we want to scale, it's a bit better than Monolith because things are not glued together, so we can just scale one thing that we need or the other thing. If we need to scale more, we'll do that. Sometimes, uh, of course, most of the time, we'll not use the servers uh, fully. But again, it's much better. We don't need uh, to scale everything. We can just scale parts of the application that uh, works. But again, we have a problem. If something fails on one machine, it can still in somehow, uh, somehow affect the other services. Most of the time, we can solve that by using Docker or something like that. But it's complicated. We just want to develop our application. We don't want to uh, care about the infrastructure and everything. So just imagine that. We don't need that white four by four piece. So we don't need the server. How would we build the application? We would simply put the, uh, our microservices uh, the way we want. And um, if we want to scale them, we would do the same uh, thing like serverless, uh, sorry, like microservice. So we can just scale some things. 
It should work. If we don't need something, we should be able just to remove it. And just imagine that someone is doing scaling automatically for us. And also, besides scaling, uh, things that fails will be replaced automatically. So that really sounds great, right? At least for me, it sounds really, really good because I'm not that good in infrastructure and everything. Also, imagine that you don't need to pay for the things that you don't use at the moment. So let's go back to the previous image. So imagine that you don't use yellow part at some moment. You don't need to pay for it. And if you uh, use six green parts, you need to pay for those six parts when you're using them. Then it's really easy for us to sell that to our boss or, some, uh, or clients or something like that because they don't need to pay upfront for scaling and everything else while we are developing everything. And that sounds really, really awesome for me because it's much easier to build a good application, good uh, architecture of the application without any problems. And that's serverless. That's exactly the thing that we call serverless today. And for me, it works really well. But let's see how does it work. We have some function and some microservices. I really didn't explain how that works. So basically, we have that function, and each function is um, actually serverless is event driven. So your function is invoked when something happens. And what does that mean? So imagine that this is our function, like a light bulb, and we have some trigger. And when we click on that trigger, it will work. When we turn it off, it will stop working. And uh, like a light bulb for serverless, we are paying for our functions only when they are working. So like uh, electricity and light bulb. It's even better than light bulb because you don't need to buy it upfront. You just pay for electricity. Also, you can trigger uh, your uh, serverless function with a few different things. Just imagine triggering light with Alexa or with mobile application or some sensors or whatever. And also, you can have multiple triggers for the same uh, function, so that works nice. And a really important thing, which is not working exactly like uh, light bulbs is uh, scaling. So if you need more light, it will automatically give us more light. And al also, if our light bulb is broken, it will be automatically replaced. So it works the same, uh, serverless works the same way, like th uh, that way. Uh, and it's also stateless, so basically, it doesn't know anything about uh, your application and things like that. Uh, Again, like a light bulb. Your light bulb doesn't know anything if your light is turned on or off or how you turned it on or off. There's electricity and it will work. That's it. So that's nice, but uh, we are not building anything with light bulbs. So at least I'm not doing that. I hope some, some of you are doing some cool things with the Internet of Things. How does this work with some real systems? So let's see some system, part of some system, like a monolith application or whatever. Um, so imagine we have some kind of API or something like that, and then um, our user sends some API request they want to sign up and uh, by mobile application or whatever. Then we have some kind of uh, sign up controller that should do a validation and things like that. Then it will contact the database to see if that user exists in the database. If it doesn't exist, it will create it. Then we'll go back to our, let's call it sign up controller which will trigger some email service, which will just send a welcome email to our user, and then finally we'll send the, the answer back to the API. Of course, we can build this much better, but if you want to use just one server and you don't have any kind of queue and things like that, you would just bundle everything together in the beginning. And the problem is, if your email uh, sending uh, service fails for some reason, it can affect everything. So just imagine that users sign up, but we tried to send an email, but for some reason, email is not sent, and we return the error to that, that user via API. But uh, if that user retries, uh, that user already exists in the database, uh, he just didn't receive an email, so that can be a problem. And let's see how would we build this uh, as a serverless app. This is showing the AWS infrastructure, but you can do the same thing with anything else. So basically, our API is now on some uh, separate service, which is called API Gateway in AWS. So when we receive an API call, 
API Gateway will process that call and see which Lambda function or serverless function should it call. It, it will call sign up function that will just check the database, do validation the same way you would do that in the old application. And when you write something in the database and uh, that user is ready, you'll simply return uh, the response on your API call to that user. In, at the same time, because Lambda functions can be triggered with different things, uh, your database can trigger your Lambda function, another Lambda function, or the same one, it's up to you. And that other Lambda function will use some third party service to send a welcome email. It's unrelated to, to sign a process because it's not blocking it in any way. And if it fails, it really doesn't affect uh, sign a process at all. So that's why I love serverless. It allows me to build some things that, uh, from the very beginning, allows me to, uh, it will just do uh, auto recovery and all those things for me. I don't need to care about those things. And I mentioned triggers, so let's immediately see what can trigger that Lambda functions. First, it can be an API, so simple HTTP request, things that you are using most of the time. Also, if you want to manage some files, you can upload file to S3 or some other service and that can trigger Lambda function and uh, we can process the, uh, that file or something, uh, do something else, log something or whatever. Also, there can be some kind of notification, so we can just send some kind of notification from one server to, uh, to just trigger Lambda function, process something. Then it can be an email, so if you receive an email or something like that, so imagine you want to build, uh, for example, uh, some customer support uh, service for, I don't know, small startup or something like that, Whenever you receive email, it can just pass that email to, to write things, maybe open Jira issue or whatever. Then it could be some stream of data. You can stream any kind of data and at some point you can just convert that data with Lambda and uh, put it back in the stream. And of course there's many, many other things. And yeah, it's a bit boring, so let's... First, let's talk just a few minutes about platforms because that's important and then we'll go to a code. Um, as some, uh, whoever uh, heard about Lambda probably know, uh, serverless probably knows about AWS Lambda, so Amazon is the first uh, who did serverless applications. Then there was Microsoft with uh, Azure functions. After that we have Google Cloud uh, with Google Cloud functions, and that's not everything. Now we have even more of them, like uh, IBM OpenWhisk and uh, Web Tasks and things like that. But for me, the most important is uh, Amazon, because I'm using that most of the time, and for me it's most reliable, but you can try other things. It should work the same way. Uh, and it's important because of thing called AWS Lambda, as I mentioned, and let's see how, what's important about Lambda. And first let's talk about uh, how much do you pay for AWS Lambda. And it's like 20 cents for one million requests. And what's request? Uh, if you have an API, it's basically an API call. You can have up to one million requests for 20 cents. Uh, it, it depends. If your API request is a bit longer and things like that, they will count it as a, more requests. They're using 100 milliseconds of uh, processing time as one request. So if your API call is uh, one uh, second or something like that, it will count as 10 requests. But again, uh, 100,000 requests for 20 cents, it's really cheap, at least for me. Also, first million requests each month are free. So it basically means that you can go and play and uh, not pay for anything. You can even build some serious things like uh, some API that serves some things and pay zero dollars per month. That's really important for me. But also you're paying for traffic, but uh, they're giving a lot of traffic. So uh, if you're not converting some really big files, uh, you will not hit that uh, limit and start paying for traffic anytime soon. So how it works? First, it has a time up. Uh, it can uh, process something for up to five minutes. Important thing with serverless is that you don't have a server that works all the time. It will be triggered by some request. So it, uh, it will wake up, process your request, and uh, it will be turned off. And your request can uh, last up to 300 seconds, so up to five minutes. By default, limit is three seconds, and you can increase it. Uh, that limit is there just to help you to 
build a better API and to, I don't know, uh, pay less and things like that. So basically, if you have something that uh, is taking more than five minutes to process, it's probably, Lambda is probably not a good tool for you. Or maybe you're doing something wrong, who knows? Uh, it really depends what you're doing. Then another important thing is amount of memory that you have. By default, you have 100, uh, yeah, 128 megabytes of memory on each Lambda. That's RAM memory, that's processing and everything. And it can go up to 1.5 gigabytes of memory. This is mostly important if you're processing files and things like that, because you want more memory to, to be able to process the files faster and things like that. And uh, if you take more memory, you'll get more CPU power and things like that. You don't control your machine. That's something that you'll uh, get from AWS. Also, each Lambda function have uh, just 500 megabytes of non-persistent storage. So if you want to save a state of your, I don't know, uh, you want to build, for example, chatbot, and you want to see the whole uh, conversation with the user, you're not able just to store that on Lambda function, but because you never know if the same function will be invoked again. You have just 500 megabytes of non-persistent storage. You can store it for up to five minutes, and on the next request, it will disappear. It's like a golden fish. That sounds like a problem, but again, uh, if you think about microservices, this is not a problem because everything needs to be stateless, and this forces to be uh, completely stateless. And finally, uh, this number is changing all the time, but by default, if you don't do anything, uh, you can have up to 1,000 Lambda working at the same time. So you can scale up to 1,000 uh, users and requests at the same second without doing anything. Amazon will do that for you. If you need more, you just need to write an email to support and they will uh, increase that limit. So that sounds really cool, at least for me. You can really do some API and some, uh, if users uh, start using it, it will just work. Also, this is JavaScript conference, but let's quickly see what languages can you use on AWS Lambda. First, you can of course use Node.js, this is most important for us, but you can use Python, you can use Java, you can use C Sharp now. Uh, Basically, you can write any kind of shell script, and you can run any executable file that can be run on Linux. With Azure functions, it's almost the same. It's Node.js, it's C Sharp, but they have F Sharp too. They have Python. They have also PHP, so if someone is doing PHP, you can try that. You can uh, run, it's PowerShell scripts because this is Windows, and basically any executive, any executable f uh, file that you have. With Google, uh, at the moment, you can run only Node.js, nothing else. But uh, they will probably add more things, who knows. So, next thing, oops, we should discuss is why is it important? And why would you care about this? First, it's minimal maintenance and minimal configuration. Uh, you don't need to set up a bunch of things before you start coding and things like that. You can just start coding and that's it. Also, you don't need to maintain a bunch of other things. You, can, you of course, need to maintain your code. No one will do that for you. But uh, you really don't need to maintain the servers and everything else. Someone else will do uh, that for you. Then, important thing is uh, economic uh, financial incentive. So, uh, it's cheaper, and this is a great article well, that explains this. It's cheaper. You, as a developer, probably don't care that much about the cost and everything else because you, most of the time you're not the one that uh, pays for servers and everything. But with serverless, uh, this is probably the first architecture that we have that forces us to uh, build good uh, applications uh, through microservices and things like that. And if we do that, uh, we will pay less. If we don't uh, write good code, we'll pay more because uh, we'll have more machines and things like that. So this financial thing uh, really helps us to sell this to our uh, clients, to our boss, or whoever we need to sell this idea to. And it will simply help us to focus on our code and everything, and it will not cost more and anyone else. Also, it's great for some side projects and thing, things like that. You can just simply try to um, try something with Lambda and uh, decide if you want to go back to a traditional thing when you gain some uh, users and things like that. So again, I've mentioned microservices multiple times and I'll not talk more about that. You can build microservices and it forces you to build a real microservices. This is really, really important. It's automatic scaling, which is cool. 
but more important, automatic failover. So if something fails, you saw that it will automatically recover because each machine will run just one function. So if you have 1,000 users, we'll have 1,000 machines. And that's not a problem because you're paying just 20 cents for 1 million requests. And you don't care how many machines uh, will Amazon spin up for you. So it's the same, price is the same for uh, Azure, for uh, Microsoft, and it's similar for Google. So it's not just Amazon. Everyone is on the same uh, level. And finally, you can just focus on your business logic and you can solve the problem uh, that you're good at, so coding and things like that. You don't need to care about some things that are not really your job. Sometimes you don't need to care about that in larger companies, but uh, I'm working in a small company, so most of the time I need to fix some things, to manage some things regarding infrastructure and things like that. So this helps me really a lot. And let's go finally and see how it works with Node.js, because I think that's most important for us here. So I would say it, that it fits, Node.js fits Lambda really, really well. And let's see what's, uh, what's a good thing uh, about Node.js on AWS Lambda. So first one is uh, good startup performance. Because, of course, there's some latency. AWS needs to spin up your uh, machine. Uh, it will take some time. It's really a small latency. It's like uh, less than 100 milliseconds. But also, it needs to run your, uh, your code. So uh, it, it will need to start Node.js or anything else. So, there's a big difference if you're writing Lambda functions in Node.js and, for example, in Java, because Java will need much, much more time to start everything, uh, start everything so you'll have a larger latency at the beginning. Other uh, good thing with Node.js are small modules, because Lambda functions should do one thing or few related small things, and if we have smaller modules, we'll need to upload smaller code on the Lambda function, and uh, it will do just one thing, so small modules work perfectly with Lambda functions. Also, it has a good performance with uh, low CPU and memory. So for example, by default, we have uh, 128 uh, megabytes of RAM memory. It's good, it's good enough for Node.js. It will not affect uh, our memory and everything that much. Uh, also, it's a single thread, which is good, again, because of that uh, machine that we'll get from AWS, it, it can uh, do many things, so it will work really well. And finally, it's quite easy to learn, at least to learn enough to, to be able to build something. But of course, there are some problems. And uh, probably the biggest problem is async. Why is it a problem? It's probably the most uh, powerful feature of Node.js, but the problem with uh, serverless is that as you remember, you have one machine that is handling one request. So you really don't need to be async because there's no other requests that are going to the same machine. So basically, that's a bit problematic because most of the problems that I saw that people had with uh, serverless, uh, we have some library for serverless and most of the problems we receive uh, as Jira issues and on Gitter are related to promises and to uh, async uh, functionality. So most of the time people has a problem with async and that's, uh, that can cause a problem with serverless. Uh, Node is made for scalability, and you really don't need to scale anything here because one machine will handle just one request, so you don't need to think about that. That's one great thing because Amazon will do that for you. Also, you have small modules, but not module size can be really huge. I, I, I hope you checked some, uh, sometimes how, how big it is. It can be really huge, so sometimes if you install some packages, it, they will install some sub-packages and sub-packages and you can end up with 500 megabytes for some simple thing. So that can be a problem. And as I say, as I said, uh, uh, Node.js is easy to learn, but also it's easy to fuck up. You, you can make a bunch of <laughs> really weird errors. Of course, uh, it's not related only for, uh, to serverless, but uh, to Node.js in general. So, um, Let's see how, how do we write a serverless function. And if you go to AWS uh, website and see hello world, I really don't like hello world that much, but let's start with this. You'll see something like this. And most, most of the lines, as you can see, is just console logs. It's really not important. 
Basically, the only important things that you have here is export handler. So you're exporting some function. So before that, uh, are you familiar with ES6 uh, syntax? So arrow functions and things like that? OK. Cool. Uh, so basically, we are just exporting one function, which will uh, accept event, some context related to. Event will give us the, uh, sorry, the information about what triggered Lambda function and uh, what's the payload that that thing sent to Lambda function. Is that, uh, I don't know, API gateway or some, some kind of API, or that's some uh, upload of some file or something else. Context will give us information about our Lambda function. For example, how much time uh, uh, do we uh, have to execute our code and things like that. And basically, uh, some callback function. And if we want to send back some hello world, we simply need to invoke that callback function and to send the JSON file or whatever. That's it. It should be simple, right? And now we want to deploy that. And how do we deploy that? First, we need to create Lambda function. You can go to AWS UI, click on a few uh, buttons, enter the name of your function, and it should be created. Not a big thing. Then you need to upload your code. And how do you upload your code? By simply zipping everything together, including node modules and everything, and uploading that. It's not really fun. It's not fun when you have a big node module size. That's a problem why node module size is, uh, can be a problem for serverless. Also, you need to create, if you want to create an API, you need to create an uh, API gateway uh, instance and to explain your API and, uh, I don't know, uh, build all the routes and things like that. Then you need to uh, tell your Lambda function that that API will trigger it. Finally, you need to set up some permissions, and if you go and read it, it will take more than 10 minutes just to read it. So, okay, this is one time thing. You need to learn that one time, but again, it's boring to spend 10 minutes and deploying something which is really simple like this. So, how do we speed up that? Sorry for this. Uh, basically, there are some frameworks. They're not real frameworks because they're not like uh, Express or something. Actually, even Express is really lightweight, but those frameworks are more things that helps you to deploy Lambda functions. So it's more like deployment libraries with some helper functions. And probably the most uh, famous one is serverless framework. Uh, they're probably uh, part of the reason why serverless is that popular term. Then there's Cloudia.js. And uh, there's Apex. Those are the three most famous frameworks for Node.js. And uh, I'll talk a bit more about Cloudia.js because uh, I'm one of the contributors on that project. And it's not a small project anymore. It has almost uh, 70,000 downloads so far. And um, yeah. <laughs> so let's see what it can do. First, it will help you to build microservices. So some normal small things. Then it can help you to build a web API that will be auto-scaled, so it should be easy with Claudia. We'll see how to do that really soon. And finally, it can help you to build chatbots, which uh, we just added that because it was really easy, and it really makes sense for chatbots because whenever someone sends you a message, you spin up a Lambda function and answer that message, and you turn off your Lambda function. It's really simple. And with Cloudia, you can build chatbots for 10 different platforms right now. So you can deploy the same code to Facebook, uh, Viber, Telegram, uh, Slack, and a bunch of other platforms, including Skype. And, yeah. So what's the main characteristics of uh, Cloudia? First, you can deploy and update with a single command. So remember those steps that you saw that you need to do every time you want to deploy something? We remove that with Cloudia. You just need to run one function, and everything will work. Then, you can use standard NPM modules. You don't need to use anything special. It's just Node. So you can use modules that you used on your Express application. You can also use Express application and deploy it uh, on uh, AWS Lambda. There's no boilerplate. You just focus on your work, and that's it. You, you don't need to uh, do some special things to be able to deploy it. Uh, we'll see. You just need to use uh, promises for APIs, but I'll explain that. It's really easy to manage multiple versions. So you can have a development version. When it's ready for QA, you can just label that version as, a, I don't know, staging or whatever. 
then someone can test that with a staging database and everything. And then you, you can just deploy it on production. And same code that was tested will just be deployed to production. And that's it. And uh, still, the, the staging and dev versions will work. And it's not that hard to uh, roll, uh, roll back to previous versions. And finally, you should be able to start really, really quickly with that. We have that flat learning curve. And let's talk about that flat learning curve. What does that mean? Is, how flat is that learning curve? Is it flat like Earth? <laughs> so uh, let's see how do we build a simple API with it. Uh, let's say uh, I found some uh, JSON file with Chuck Norris jokes. So let's use that to, to build a small API with Chuck Norris jokes. So first we want to, uh, to install Claudia. And you simply do that by installing it from uh, NPM. And we want to save it globally. You don't need to do that, but I like doing that. Then you need to set up credentials. It's really simple. It's just uh, storing uh, uh, two things from API Gateway in, uh, in one file or on your computer. It's AWS thing. It's not Claudia thing. And uh, it's explained both on Claudia site and uh, AWS website. Then we want to create some kind of folder and simply enter that folder, do npm init. To, to get the package JSON file, and simply install Cloudia API Builder. And that's it. That's everything we need so far. And let's build our uh, simple function now. So we'll create some API.js file. And first, we'll require a Cloudia API Builder. So it's really simple. It's just a normal require. Then we'll make an instance of, of that API, because it's a class. Finally, we will require that jokes from a jokes JSON file. That file will be deployed with your code to your Lambda function. And then, uh, if you're familiar with Express or anything like that, you're familiar with routes and things like that. So basically, if you want to create some route that will be a GET request on your uh, root domain, uh, we simply return those jokes. We don't need to do anything else. We can just simply do return, and that's it. We don't need to use uh, response.send.something, we simply return something and that, that's it. And finally, we need to export your API because Claudia will take your API and put it as a middleware between uh, request and response in your Lambda function. So that's it. And if you want to create your Lambda function, you go to your terminal in the same folder, you can run Claudia create, then you need to specify region. Uh, that's again because of uh, AWS. I'm using uh, Frankfurt. Uh, because it's closest to, to Serbia, but you can choose any of the regions from AWS website. And finally, we want to tell our Claudia, uh, to tell Claudia that we want to build APIs, so we are providing API module flag, and we want to tell Claudia which file is our initial file in, uh, in that uh, function. And as you remember, we made the API.js file, so we'll say simply API without JS extension here, and that's it. When we run that, we need to wait maybe 45 seconds or so. It depends on the internet connection. And we'll have response like this. As you can see, there's a big URL at the bottom. And I just used bit.ly to shorten it. And if you want, you can test it. It's just a simple API that uh, works. That's exactly what I did. And you have an API. And now you'll see some kind of uh, API response with old jokes. It will scale, so if 500 people visit that at the same time, it will work. The presentation will be online later, and uh, if, uh, I, I will not do live coding right now, but I'll, I will be outside, so later, if anyone wants to see this in action, just come and ask me, I'll, I'll show you. And let's try to update our API with some, some other things. For example, let's try to add, uh, we want to get one joke, just one joke by ID, and let's, uh, for example, get a random joke. We don't care which one we'll get. So if we want to add that, we can add more routes. As you can see, one Lambda function can do one thing, but you can bundle more uh, similar things to the same Lambda function, because if you want to deploy uh, some API for jokes, you really don't want to manage three different Lambda functions, because if you want to update, for example, jokes.json file, you'll need to redeploy three of them you can simply bundle all three of them in the same function and have some small API. For example, if you want 
to build users' microservice. You want to have everything related to users in the same Lambda function. It will not cost you anything. You can do that. It's easier for you to, uh, uh, to maintain it later. So basically, what do we do? First, we want to get some ID. And as you can see, we can just uh, create another uh, API.get uh, route for, for some ID. That, that's the difference uh, between Cloudia, actually AWS and uh, Express. Uh, it's not a colon ID, it's ID in curly braces, but that's a simple difference. And then we have request. This time we have request. Request is the things that we received in our API request. And uh, we can filter all jokes by, by joke ID, which we uh, received in uh, request.petparams.id. That's our ID that is inside the, sorry, inside our URL. And finally, if we want to do random joke, Again, we just need to return a random, uh, random item from uh, jokes array. That's it. If we want to update it, we simply run Cloudy update. We wait for a few seconds, and we can test it by just doing slash random at the end, and we'll get some random joke. It's really simple. But now, if we want to test uh, joke by ID, it's not working for some reason. So it's really simple. I just did, uh, I just checked if ID from the, some joke is uh, the same as ID from your URL. So how do we test if something is not working? We can do, we can do a console log, of course. We would do that in a classical node application. But where do we see that console log? Because your Lambda function is not in your machine. So how, how do you know what's, what's wrong with it? So, Let's spend a few minutes to talk about uh, debugging serverless function, and we'll do that quickly. So you can see your console logs in CloudWatch. CloudWatch is another service uh, offered by AWS, and basically just monitoring for your cloud functions and uh, any cloud resource on AWS. It can, beside that, it can trigger, uh, it can send some kind of alarms and things like that. So imagine that you have some other service that is not Lambda-based, and that you want to monitor performance. At some point, uh, you see that your server is not working anymore or something like that, you can uh, use that alarm to trigger your Lambda function and do something if you want or something like that. You can e do even things like that. Or you can uh, do some kind of cron job, or things like that. So uh, there's a few ways how to use uh, uh, CloudWatch. Uh, you can do that from web console, of course, but uh, my pr uh, preferred way is AWS command line tool. and Command is something like this. You really don't need to, to care about the command right now. And you get something like this, which is a bunch of text. But the thing that is important for us is right there. And it takes some time for you to get used to this. And you can, of course, filter those things. And, uh, but uh, it really takes some time to, to get used to all those information that it will send to you. But basically, we saw that the problem with our ID is that uh, parameter ID is a string. And we used uh, three equal signs to, to uh, compare it with the ID from a JSON file, which is a number, and that's why it failed. If you're using Web Console, you'll see something like this. It's a bit better, but again, it's not perfect. But after some time, you get used to that, and you can also uh, build a bunch of filters so you can just see this information. And if you want to update our function, you should just, uh, for example, do uh, two equal signs, and uh, we don't need an array anymore, so let's just uh, take the first element. This can break, but anyway, let's do that for now. And if we redeploy it, it will be something like this. So that's it. Debugging is really not fun in AWS, so we are trying to uh, improve that. Uh, and Claudia will run your function, and if you have some syntax error, things like that, Claudia will let you know before you deploy your Lambda function. And that way will save some time uh, if you have some issue or something like that. Then the really important thing that you should do is writing tests. And how do you do that with the serverless function? Um, this is probably for some, another, uh, some other talk, but if anyone wants to see more, uh, you'll be able to see in, uh, after this talk in the, in the call. But basically, you can use anything you use for your standard modules. You can use Jest, you can use Jasmine. I'm using Jasmine most of the time. Uh, if you want to see an example, I would uh, say go to Claudia API Builder, uh, sorry, Bot Builder uh, 
project on GitHub and just see how we did the test because Bot Builder is simply a bunch of APIs for all webhooks. It's really simple. That's, we used Jasmine to write tests and everything, and that's it. The other problem that people mostly have with uh, serverless is that they really don't know how your infrastructure looks anymore. But AWS built another tool called AWS X-Ray, which will allow you to see your infrastructure like this. So you'll be able to see how your request is going through all uh, different servers uh, or DynamoDBs and other things. And finally, you know how everything works in the, in the background. So what's other important thing? What's the easiest way for you to learn serverless? It's a bit hard if you Google everything because there's a bunch of resources, but most of them are just uh, talking about the name serverless, not the functionality and everything. So the easiest way probably is to go to any framework and just try to play with it. It's really simple. All of them has a bunch of examples. And what's the funniest way to learn serverless? Because we want to make it fun. And uh, we built this. This is a small workshop, and uh, people are just building. Uh, so those tanks are uh, just serverless functions. We have two teams. They're building serverless functions for, uh, for each tank. And uh, finally, uh, all the time you're just receiving a bunch of requests. Each request is just uh, things that are surrounding your tank. Uh, tank. And then you can uh, respond with go forward, go backward, turn left, turn right, or shoot. The point is to shoot your opponent. After, I don't know, 300 uh, moves, a fire will start everywhere and uh, we'll pick random winner. So if you want to play with that, you can go to serverless.camp website and you can host that in your user group or whatever. We did a few of those uh, workshops and they went really, really well. Uh, and go play with it. Most of the time it's not that dangerous. <laughs> so. Let's go really quickly uh, through the list of things that uh, where you should uh, shouldn't use serverless. It's more important to see where you shouldn't use serverless because when you see how easy it is, we will try to put it everywhere. And of course, it's not for everything. First, if you have a real-time application that needs re uh, web sockets, serverless is not for that because you don't have server all the time. Your server will disappear after uh, your request. So it's not for that. You can use some additional ser uh, services to, to do that, but anyway, so, uh, serverless is not yet for this thing. If you need some really low latency uh, APIs, so if you need to guarantee uh, that you'll respond in less than 200 milliseconds, serverless is probably not for you. Most of the time you will respond in less than 200 seconds, but you're not able to guarantee that because uh, of AWS and everything else. Most of the time it's really fast, but it can be a bit slower. It's really depending on AWS. If you need to customize your server configuration, serverless is obviously not for you. When you need custom compliance, if you want to build, for example, medical application or something like that, probably you shouldn't use serverless. Now you can do that with, uh, with API gateway and things like that, but it's probably not a good idea yet. Then if you have some long, long running tasks, again, it's not for that. You have up to five minutes for your request. If you have some uh, complex computing, there's probably better things for that because you, you have limited uh, memory and things like that. And if you need to guarantee something uh, that is not the same as the things that AWS guarantee for you, you should probably not use it for that. So where should you use serverless? So for example, if you want to build web API, you saw it's really simple to do that. You can even build much, much more complex things, really easy. If you want a backend, like an API for a single page web application, it's really cool because most of the things will be on your front end and then serverless will, you will not pay anything for a backend. It will just save the state in some kind of database and return it and do some processing. For chatbots, it's really easy. Uh, on previous uh, HollyJS in Moscow, we built a small chatbot for our conference, so it was really easy. Uh, it still works. <laughs> we didn't touch it from that, that time. Uh, if you want to build quick prototype some uh, small applications that uh, can become a real solution at that point, uh, some point. As you know, quick fixes and uh, quick prototypes are most of the time long-term solutions. So it's good for that. Uh, for processing files, it's great for that. Internet of Things, you can use it for that. And there's many, many other things. 
So, how can you start it using today? If you have small side project, go for it. You can use AWS Lambda plus AWS ecosystem. You should use uh, Cloudia.js or serverless framework or something like that because it's faster. If you have some big uh, service, uh, you can just move one small thing to that service. For example, processing images or something like that. So you have existing application and some features uh, in AWS Lambda. And quickly you'll see that you'll just try to pack as many things in AWS Lambda because it's cool, but yeah. So is serverless secure? And we'll see. <laughs> What about AWS Lambda security? I'll talk about AWS Lambda. It should apply to all other uh, things, but uh, I know this one the best. So first, your server exists for a few hundred milliseconds. It's really hard to hack something that exists for 300 milliseconds. You really need to be fast. Then it's read-only, except temporary file, of course, a folder, of course. So that's a good thing because no one is able to uh, just put something on your server because it will disappear on the next, next request. There's no dedicated server. If someone puts something in that temporary uh, folder, it will disappear on the next request, but no one guarantees you that you'll get the same machine again. Then there's sandbox uh, and containers on AWS uh, side, so AWS is handling all those things. There's no configuration, so it's, easy, uh, it's hard to do something wrong there. It's auto-scaling, so it's, again, it's helping with security. And AWS ecosystem, AWS is uh, helping us to, to be secu as secure as we can. Of course, there are some problems. The first problem is bad code. No one uh, can uh, help you and save you from your bad, bad code. So if you do something wrong, it will be wrong, even on AWS Lambda. Everything is about permission. So if you set wrong permission, someone can use that and do something uh, with it. Again, it's not that easy, but it can. Uh, there are third-party libraries, so if you install some malicious uh, node mod uh, module, it can affect uh, your uh, application. There can be problems with other building blocks. So if you have S uh, some MySQL server or something like that, there are still things like SQL injections. Managing keys and security uh, in, and secrets can be really a problem. Now AWS Lambda is handling that uh, really good, but uh, in previous versions, a year ago, everything w it was really bad. So uh, it was really good for uh, web APIs, but for everything else, it was harder. And finally, is it secure? It really depends on you. For me, it gives me a better set of problems uh, to deal with. And that's it about security. And I have additional thing because it's eight, po uh, eight and a half things about serverless. And let's discuss the name a bit because that's the most con controversial thing about serverless. You know less is more. So I would say that serverless is more servers. <laughs> but you don't care about them. You don't handle them. Uh, there are servers, of course. So uh, this is a great tweet that explains uh, how sometimes we just need to change the name of our uh, platform and to become more popular and things like that. So it's uh, simply platform as a service evolved evolve to serverless, and that's, that's it. And here's a short history of the name. In 2012, this, this was the first article that mentioned uh, serverless. Not in a way that we are using it today, but that was the first uh, time we saw serverless uh, keyword that we know. Then in 2014, AWS Lambda, uh, uh, AWS uh, made AWS Lambda, so they started using serverless keyword. Not that much until 2015 when they released the API Gateway. Then there was this article, which was, yeah, a bit <laughs> too much. Then uh, JavaScript AWS became serverless framework, and then after that, everything is going up with the serverless keyword. In 2016, it's, everyone is so much talking about serverless keyword. It, it was probably a biggest buzzword. So someone uh, tweeted this, uh, serverless is just the name, we could call it Jeff or something else. Or as my friend want, uh, li likes to uh, compare serverless, is uh, serverless is something like Wi-Fi. Uh, in Wi-Fi, there's still wires, but you don't care about wires. So in serverless, there's still uh, servers, but you don't care about them. Someone else will care about that. And serverless is everywhere now, and uh, who's using serverless? So many, many uh, different companies, including Netflix and Coca-Cola and me, <laughs> and a bunch of other things. So uh, let's do a quick summary of uh, what we heard today. So yeah, serverless is function as a service, but uh, 
it's, uh, it, it's fully managed and it will help you to focus on your business logic. Then it's event driven and there's a bunch of things that can uh, trigger serverless function. It's auto scaling and auto failover. Again, it's really important for us. It works nice with Node.js. It can be a bit of a problem, but it should work really fine. There are, there are three major frameworks. And it's a bit tricky to debug, so you should write tests. And finally, go and try it. Just play with it and uh, you'll see it's really cool. Also, important thing, of course, there are still servers and as we know, it's someone else's computer, it's not a cloud or serverless, but uh, we don't care about that computer and that's the main uh, advantage of serverless. And that would be it. <laughs>